Hello there, lovely viewers, and welcome to another episode of Disability Horizons TV's We Don't Have a Name for This Show show. Yes, we've yet to name this show, even though it's the fifth episode. Uh, so if you have got a name for the show that we could use that would be able to be transmitted, please send it in. But in the meantime, we'll just go with welcome to this show. I'm Mick Scarlett. I'm leading today's discussion. But as usual, I am joined by my two fantastic co-presenters. It's one, Zek the Tech Richardson. Say hello, Zek. Hello. Oh, no, not so much. I there you go, you see, he's just done hello. some more <laughs> He's just done some more remorse. So we've any tech issues, it's not his fault. So that's it's Zek. Right. Hello, Zek. I thought I was more good we've also... Good evening. Yeah, we've... <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, see, it was all going to be professional, but we forgot. We can't do professional. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have Dan the Man White. Good evening, folks. Good evening. Hey. Oh, yeah, there I am. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, talking <laughs> about names from the show, uh, I was thinking about, how about Mrs. Squibb's four-foot divan? That's a really good name. No one's ever going to forget that. What do you reckon? You're a very strange Cross man. it out to the audience, that very one. Mrs. Squibb's four-foot divan. Yes. Uh, and so we've got Zet the Tech, <laughs> Dan the Man, which me leaves me, Mick the... I know, let's Three. move on to meet our guest for today. It's Carol Barraclough from Yay. the Spinal Injuries Association. Hello, Carol. Hello, everybody. So we'll, we'll, we'll get her to introduce herself in a little bit, but I've got to make the regular disclaimer that this show is about our lived experience. It's not what we're all going to say stuff that is what we think... It's our views. It's what worked for us. It what didn't work for us. We're not experts. We're not specialists. We're not professionals. And we're also not sharing the views of Disability Horizons itself. We're just three gobshites and a wonderful guest who are going to be talking about stuff around disability. That's the title. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. And today we're going to be talking about becoming disabled. But before we go to that, I think it's really important that we introduce the wonderful Carol and let her tell us a little bit about herself. So come on, Carol, tell us who you are, what you do. Tell us, regale us of your life story. Why, thank you. So yeah, so I'm Carol. Um, and because it's not obvious, I need to tell you that I have a spinal cord injury um, at level T9. Those who don't know the anatomy, that's kind of around belly button level. Um, and my injury is as a result of a condition called transverse myelitis, which I was diagnosed with back in 2006. So presents exactly as you would see a classic spinal cord injury caused by a traumatic injury, like an, in, an accident or a fall. Um, but something, either my own autoimmune system or um, a virus attacked the myelin sheath around my spinal cord, which left me with a complete paralysis. So I am a full time chair user um, and I can't wait bare and I have no sensation at all below my level of injury. Um, it also means um, for those not familiar with spinal cord injuries that my bowel and bladder are affected. So I have um, double incontinence, which is managed. Um, but yeah, it wasn't something that I was expecting to happen to me. Um, and actually looking back, that was the biggest challenge for me, my um, continence rather than my ability to walk. Um, losing Using a chair, you know, as much as it's a bit of a pest, kind of okay. But the continence thing, you know, I was in my mid thirties, I wasn't expecting it to happen. So, so that's kind of me in a nutshell. Um, at the time of my injury, I was working, I was a solicitor. Um, and returning to work as a solicitor is pretty easy when you're using a wheelchair, um, quite an easy job to do sitting down. So that was quite helpful. But then the um, firm that I worked with, um, I carried on practicing for another 10 years. Um, but the firm that I worked in started kind of disbanding and closing. So I was put on gardening leave, but at the time I was also uh, six months pregnant. So um, yeah, I am also a mum to a beautiful seven-year-old who dips between being a delight and a shit, um, as most seven-year-olds are. Um, and I started during my gardening leave, I started working for the charity Spinal Injuries Association um, 
doing admin. Um, yeah, I just wanted to do something um, with myself. So, um, yeah, I've been with Spinal Injuries Association, um, a charity based down in Milton Keynes um, since 2015. Um, and yeah, I absolutely love it. And a lot of people with disabilities talk about giving something back. So I guess there's a bit of wanting to do that. Um, but also it's, yeah, there's a lot of things that people don't know about people with disabilities. So I'm really happy to kind of impart my experience and my knowledge. And there's lots of transferable skills actually from being a solicitor to that in terms of, you know, you're using my experience and my own um, knowledge to let other people kind of have a better way of life almost. Because you work in peer support now, don't you? Yeah. So we, um, I'm part of the team that yeah, does that offers peer support to um, other people who've sustained a spinal cord injury, so irrespective of cause. Um, obviously, with spinal cord injuries, you get different levels of lesions. So I have paraplegia, but you can get people with tetraplegia who may have hand um, and arm limitations. But there's a lot of stuff that we have that is the same, irrespective of our level of condition, you know, in terms of access and what chairs to use, driving, going back to work. So, um, yeah, so it's a really you know rewarding role in terms yeah. of imparting information and I think you touched on it a bit at the start mate you know the, the good and the bad you know I've done some things really well since I've had my disability but I've done things shockingly bad um but I wouldn't be able to share those experiences if I hadn't done them um yeah. and I think there is an element of you kind of need to do things quite badly to learn from your mistakes and think right yeah I won't do that again I mean, it's kind of why we do the show is because of that peer support thing. I think it's really important. I've done a lot of work around it myself. And I think that yeah. disabled people supporting other disabled people is really important. I don't know about you. I don't know about Zek. I don't know about Dan. But I know when I, I, I was born uh, with cancer. So I was paralyzed from very young, but only on below uh, my, sort of my knee and below on my right leg. So I could walk a bit and I run around okay. like a caliber. And then at the age of 15, my spine, very similar collapsed illness bang gone you know overnight I stopped walking and it was the aftercare that was appalling yeah uh, and it was it that was what impacted me quite heavily so that was what uh kind of I thought well I'll get back into it I was going to study psychology and be a psychologist but uh, we won't talk about what psychology teaches you around disability <laughs> as it is so depressing um but now we both had that sudden bang crash now Zek you come to disability in sort of a slightly different way didn't you tell us a bit about your journey to joining the gang yeah for me i mean i, I fell ill in uh, 90, 90 december 96 into cardiac care was told i had me so a lot of fatigue and stuff like that on top of already having mental health issues which i was told it wasn't physical it was mental health even though i had changes on uh <laughs> on the old cardio thing it was like yep it's in your head <laughs> <laughs> um, like and then, my heart too. <laughs> yeah and then you know um my knees slowly got worse and worse and as you know i probably didn't help that um i'd had knee surgery uh playing football in an aircraft hangar i kicked the floor instead of the ball and tore my knee out again and i kept believing doctors in the fact that you need more surgery you need more surgery you need more surgery and i kept going and going and as i was saying to carol before we went live fault going in a wheelchair it was the worst ever case scenario it was mm. i would die before i did it and it was a friend who was uh t5 like a uh, partial that i met at work that said to me god sakes when we were going out for a day borrow my spare chair stop you know causing yourself harm and yeah i wish i'd done it sooner because yeah. it's it's only ever portrayed as negative it's the final shame it is true it is you're you're kind of i know when i uh had my spinal injury um all the doctors spent months years trying to get me to stand up on two calipers uh, i couldn't have any i couldn't wait bear at all and i kind of basically threw myself around a little bit like a giant gorilla in new romantic makeup and would fall over all the world and hurt myself all the time i wasn't going to cut you yeah, that's a picture you're all picturing that now aren't you? i'll see if i can find the picture it's not good um and then one day I just went, I felt like I was chatting a girl up in a bar in a club in Luton where I come from. And I just was talking to her and I could feel myself going very much in the only fools and horses. We're in here 
<laughs> we're in here, mate, flop. And I just landed on the floor and I looked up at her and thought, this is stupid. So from then on, I went in the chair and life got so much better. And um, must remember, folks, if you're watching viewers, we want your comments. I've just remembered I haven't read that out. You wouldn't think I'm a trained professional, would you? So send us your comments no. and we'll read them out. We want to know your questions. Want to know your experiences? Don't just listen to us. Join in. It's your show too, and um, we want to know if you've got something you want to know about. We'll tell you, or if we can. And uh, so, come on, get get commenting, folks. Um, yeah, I, I found going in a chair was very liberating, and um, I, I I look back on that period where I thought I was going to walk. But what something I'm also interested in is that you've got Dan who. We can talk about your impairment in a bit, Dan, but you had a wonderful little girl called Emily uh, who is disabled. Yes. What's it like when you're a parent? Because obviously I was also born disabled, and but I was me. I wasn't my parents. I didn't know yeah. what they went through. And I think it's something you <clears throat> realise as you get older. So tell, what was it like when you know they came in and went, here's your baby? And Well, I, I, I personally think it depends on, on the manner and the actual ability of the doctors and the, the specialists around when they deliver the news we were in a ports of hospital when we had the scan and of course we were in the dark and i came in and oh it's bad news i'm so so sorry and of course wham your life's 90 degrees but with that hospital they couldn't actually tell us what a disability was because they had no experience of it and this was spina bifida and hydrocephalus she thought pretty much any gp or doctor or nurse or someone and medical information would know that so we had to wait two days until the monday to go to another hospital where we were sold the positives so yeah. i think it all depends on how that news is broken to you in the first place i mean there's been a bit shout about it across social media across yeah. the networks and stuff about doctors actual empathetic position and how yeah. they deliver this news it has to be done in a good way not exactly jolly and positive but they need to be honest they don't need to be negative so i think that in itself was a shocker to us but when we went to the i can say southampton hospital because they're actually incredible when they two days later they gave us all the positives and they laid it on the line without any buoyancy or negativity but soon as emily was born i know it's a cliche to say it but as soon as you saw i saw her for the first time i just thought this is emily and i wouldn't have her any other way because this this is her this is who she is and i'm always asked by people you know why didn't you have children earlier in life and my answer is, well, it wouldn't have been Emily. And mm. Emily, to me, is absolutely everything, uh, regardless of the pressure from the state and society that you have to walk and you have to stand up. Yeah. And regardless of that utter nonsense, this pays no heat. She is Emily, and she will do whatever she wants to do to the best of her ability. And now she's at that age where she can decide what surgery she wants. She's only yeah. going to have surgery, from my point of view, if it's actually yeah. to prolong her existence, if it's uh, surgery... For vanity purposes then it's going to be her to decide whether she wants it or not and i think that's an important thing that other parents have to realize is when yeah. your child gets to that age because emily went through the whole stage of being forced into standing frames and forced into this and it got to the point where I, she was chatting to you mick fun enough yeah no, and, I mean, and, I yeah. Exactly the same experience. Yeah. You know, and I, she just said she said i i really don't want to do this anymore yeah. what I, 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 yeah well i just i just you know they don't work i'm quite happy on my on my wheels yeah. Yes, I'm quite happy. So just yeah. there needs to be a point when children need to be let be because we've got to stop this yeah. this scenario. If you've got to walk, if you don't walk, you're nothing. You're nothing yeah. if you don't yeah. walk. That is in a red stand nonsense. makes her more disabled. Yes. Yeah, it's it's just nonsense that make if you walk, you're amazing. Look at the look at the Conservative Party. They all walk and they are the worst people on earth. <laughs> so there is there is don't forget, nothing folks, about walking. Not God, where is it? Just the views of Dan uh, and any right thinking person. Anyway. Want me this time, folks? Want me? Ha ha! That's funny because that's the Socialist touching... magazine. That's the... Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Uh, that's funny actually because that's touching on something I think we also all share, whether it's your child or when you became <laughs> the Dex just oh my god. Uh, uh, when you become disabled, it's how you're told. Mm -hmm. I think that plays yeah. that is the beginning. Now, what what was it like for you, Carol? What what did how did they impart the news? Um, <laughs> So I wasn't told directly because transverse myelitis, mm. kind of the onset of it and my mm. paralysis went over a period of three weeks. So I was walking with a drop fur and then I lost sensation in one leg, culminating in one night where I just simply collapsed. So I didn't really have any expectation. I was given steroids and assumed that that leg that wasn't working would come back. 
Um, and I think my, my own experience was there was a lot of flaffing about with what the diagnosis was. And to be fair, it is a condition that some people can make a recovery from, so they didn't know. But obviously I'm Googling it and you know seeing the worst things that you can happen with spinal cord injury and transverse mellitus and you know getting my head kind of in a bit of a tiz was. Um, I think, and I, actually in the work that I do now, the nursing staff and the therapists are probably the ones that are a bit more brutal and honest with people because they see you every day and they, you know, you talk to them, you know, you spend a lot of time with them. The consultants, as brilliant as they are, have got a different level of role and you know, ways in which they manage people. Some are better than others, you know, I don't deny. So I don't ever remember having that conversation with my consultant, but it would have come about with uh, the nursing staff, perhaps or the therapist in terms of, well, why are you teaching me how to do this? Because surely at some point I'll be up and about and they're like, well, no, that's not going to happen, is it? We need yeah. to get you used to being in the chair. Um, so yeah, it's so that was probably my experience, but also I was in a neurological unit um, right, yes. where... Why do you have such a similar experience? Rather than okay. going to a spinal cord injury unit, you're in a neurological unit, so it's all yeah. a bit weird and everybody's yeah. having all weird stuff going on. And yeah. you're like, Ooh, what's going on? Yeah. For me, but that was a real eye-opener because in, in the scheme of things, there were people with um, quite severe disabilities compared mm. to mine. And that was kind of three months in and I thought, you know what, in the scheme of things, I'm pretty lucky. Yeah. You know, no, I, I, I still got my hand function, I still got my brain. Yeah, I was I'm just going to have to use it. You know, I was put in a terminal ward uh, because I thought I got right. cancer again. What? So I, I, I spent three months in a terminal ward and I was the only person to come out alive. Uh, <laughs> and I saw things. Uh, if anyone's ever seen Hellraiser 2, Hellbound, there's uh, quite a few scenes set in a hell hospital. Well, that was my ward because there was just hell going on. It was awful. But as a 15 year old, it did make me realize that life is short and wonderful uh, mm -hmm. and you need to seize it. So when I got out alive, I was like, right, I'm having some fun now. And yeah. have ever since. Now, Dan, because when I was born and, and diagnosed with, with cancer, like, you know, my life expectancy was, was five years at the most. So not bad for 55, 56 this year. <laughs> but what, what did it. they say was your, the prognosis for Emily? Well, uh, initially, uh, the first one was she's got water on the brain, that classic old, mm. it's not hydrocephalus, it's water on the brain. So initially, mm. what, what sort of surgical team are we dealing with? But uh, yes, it was, yeah, it's got water on the brain. We can't tell you. It's as she grows, as she becomes verbal, as she starts to look at you, as she starts to hear things, then you're going to know if there's any degree of brain damage. Do that hydrocephalus, of course, waiting for any sign of her looking at you or hearing you was a, was a win. Obviously, when she starts to talk, and you know what she's like now, she just cannot stop for England. But that's exactly what it was. You're, you're, you're told where she was a babe, I suppose, or any child born with disabilities a babe, you're a waiting game till they're of an age where they can start, if they can be, if they can start to be vocal and vocalize what they're saying. But yeah, it was always just sit and wait, wait till she's yeah. three or four or anything like that. But yeah, it was, it was, it was very much a strange strange time this, this beautiful yeah. fantastic child in my arms and you just yeah. you don't want the time to go because you want to spend the time with them as they're a babe but obviously we needed to know because obviously we need to get that support in place should mm. it be and zet you you know how did they tell you do you know what i mean because like if it's a progressive thing and there's all different things going on and you know did you have a we've got to sit you down and tell you this, isn't it? You're never going to do this again. Or, or was it kind of a realisation? Did you just wake up and go, yeah, no, this is, they're, they're never going to fix this? <laughs> no, in fact, quite the opposite. I think they thought I was quite all right. So mine, a lot of orthopaedic surgeries and, as you know, orthopaedic surgery and surgeons, blah, 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 more and more. as you know, they're like the jocks, aren't they? They're like, we fix things. Yeah. We, nothing, yeah. for, we, yeah. we fix things. And so... When I first like was bringing up, no, I'm still in pain. Hang on, you've done this big surgery. I'm still in pain, and then another one. They're like, no, sorry, you can't be in pain because you've we've just put metal knee in, and metal doesn't have nerves. And I'm like, well, what about around it? Well, I can't walk, and they're like, you can walk, and I'm like, no, seriously, I cannot explain to you. If I could, I would. I'm not, I'm yeah. not just going to yeah. give up. Yeah. And so I had to fight them to believe that. And the same with the ME, you know, that I'm trying to push on. I'm trying my hardest to push on. 
but, but you weren't following you know, the textbook. Were you? You, you weren't yeah. following their medical textbook, which said on yeah. page forty-one after the surgery you'll be fine. You weren't following their their unexperienced medical textbook. Yeah, the they fixed me, and kicked me yeah. out, and I was meant to be yeah. all right, and they couldn't yeah, believe yeah. that I wasn't. Mm. And I think this is the thing. I think like if, if we're talking about one of the big ones around becoming disabled, uh, whether you're like we said born or you join the gang through illness or injury or whatever, it is that weird process where you learn <laughs> that actually the medical profession don't necessarily know as much as you think they know when you're not disabled you're like yeah they, they, they fix you it's like going to the garage and you get your car service and then everything works and um actually it is more like going to a garage but more like a hooky one around the corner where they charge you 50 quid and it all comes out with three wheels because because you do kind of find that they'll tell you something and then you're like well that doesn't sound like me yeah <laughs> what and um so the uh, the other thing i think that we have to talk about is the fact that once you've got all the, the medical stuff started and you've been told or you'll realize that something there's also the mental health stuff that goes on now dan i know that's your uh, impairment what what was the fight like to get diagnosed with mental health issues you know and when you were diagnosed was it a good thing or you know did you feel bad about it because I know some people, when they're diagnosed, actually feel positive because finally I know what's going on and get it treated. Absolutely. No, the, the actual diagnosis was, uh, it wasn't a surprise to me. I uh, uh, initially had a, a breakdown here in the lounge and was uh, taken to a local surgery. And my fantastic local GP, who was just absolutely incredible, just went through everything with me and said, you, you've wow. got depression. And, of course, that was an epiphany to me. But of course, you uh, the, the, the force it is that once you're diagnosed with depression, uh, like with disability, all the support will suddenly be there for you. When unfortunately it's not, it's just a case of here's your antidepressants, here's your five milligram of citalopram or whatever, and you just need to go and you know just you know, go, go, you know, go and go and do this. And of course, went away and did it. And of course, you just go home and you come accustomed to the tablets. You know, your moods are coming little bit of self safe placing i learned to self safe place myself but it wasn't initially till it got worse and worse and worse that i realized it was a bit more than depression which actually morphed into bipolar and, and you yeah. know a bit body dysmorphia that fantastic yeah. Yeah. summertime one which rises all the way up this time of year and i went to um an appointment to get an official stamp of bipolar but she said she wouldn't give it to me because she didn't want to give me a stigma <laughs> and then the first thing she said to me and my wife was with me at the time the first thing she said was have you ever thought about hurting your child and then sat back at which point my anxiety kicked into gear my depression kicked into gear i looked at my wife and she said no we're leaving we're going and we left and i said was it really as bad as that or was it me she said no that was just yeah. that was just absolutely outrageous I mean, you can see, but you can see their side. It's a lack of funding. It's a lack of people on yeah. books and stuff. But it's just I will the way, say, again, empathy, the way, way things are delivered. It, I, I wasn't going to, but I will say that, that, like I said, I was going to study psychology and I had to stop because I'd done my first year. Everything was great. And I started my second module, sec, uh, second year, first module, the identity. And the first yeah. module was identity of disability. I thought, well, this is, I'm going to say all this. So in I go. And progressively through the, the module it transpires that um that psychologists training psychologists are taught that being depressed when you are disabled is natural and that anyone who is disabled will be depressed end of that's it if you are disabled and you say you're not depressed you're mentally ill you're more mentally ill than if you are depressed because you're disabled so when you go in with any kind of illness and say i'm depressed they go oh that's because you've got an illness and then, and then it becomes this thing where you can't. I, I, I became. I've I got a couple of periods of it in my life, and it was because of a reason. There were things that were happening. One, I've just yeah. become paralysed. Two, um, my career had kind of gone down a swanee, and I was ill again, and no one knew what it was. So, reasons. And I took Prozac and got better. But everybody I saw was like, "Well, you're, you're ill because you're disabled." And I remember going to see one psychologist that went. Well, I think you've done very well. Sounding from how awful your life has been, I'd be depressed too. And it was like, I'm suicidal at the moment, mate. I'd quite like you to help me, not to say, well, if it, I was if I was you, I'd want to kill myself as well. That was helpful. So again, like you, I had to just pull myself out of it. Yeah. Now, Zach, what's your experience? I know you've also got mental health uh, struggles, don't you? Yeah, I've 
strength, uh, severe anxiety since the late 80s after an incident. And it was only literally when the orthopedic surgeon sent me to a psychiatrist because I threatened to chop my own leg off that they said, oh, you've got PTSD. And that's probably, uh, maybe I wasn't diagnosed earlier because when you first have mental health, you don't open up and it's yeah. all about opening up and giving them the tools. And I've struggled with that, but also mental health through the chronic. I think it's the pain and the fatigue that's really got me, not the wheelchair. And I have, you know, I've had periods where I've thought about taking my own life. I won't because that would be passing my pain onto my family's. Yeah. But I think it's important to talk about it. But there is a yes. lot of negativity around it. Well, you can't say you can't say you want to kill yourself. Well, no, it's mm. important because those that don't say it but feel yeah, it do it will. And I, oh, I want to yeah, touch on something I, Dan said. Yeah. Yep. Dan said about support groups. You know, once you know, make the spinal cord injury. Well, there's the spinal support, uh, etc., and so on. But there's some of us where there is no support groups because they haven't quite nailed why I'm still in pain. Yeah what's going on so there is nobody to help you and i think that's where a lot of people are probably really struggling because they are they're the unknowns yeah i think the thing is though is that again this is why we do this show and i think this is also why we, why i'm a big believer in the disabled community because we might have chronic pain for different reasons but we both have chronic pain and we've talked about it together we support yeah. each other through that and i think that you know, you know, I've always said, if you, and, and, and I know that that's what Carol does, is, you know, some spinal cord injuries feel nothing. Others live with it, you know, constant pain, constant spasms. You know, they have to have all different baclofen pumps and God knows what. And that's why I think peer support, being yeah. each other's community, is is so important. Now, Carol, what what happens at a peer support group? You know, what, what, what I know, but I want you to tell us. <laughs> so we you know, to people who join our um so we either do one-to-one -one sessions or we have um community groups obviously covid has kindly put this kibosh upon that but fingers crossed they'll be up and running quite soon um it's just the opportunity to talk about experiences that are unique for you with someone with a spinal cord injury so you know i have a brilliant support network um in my husband my family um my friends um and they know what they have to do to assist me. You know, if we're going somewhere that's inaccessible, they know they've got to kind of tip me over the curb or whatever, but they don't know what it's like to live with the disability. You know, yeah. that, yeah. you know, I didn't want to get out of bed today, but I've got a seven year old, so I had to, but it was a real struggle. My spasms mm. were causing havoc. Um, you know, I just really didn't have the energy. My shoulders are knackered because I've been pushing around for the last 15 years, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And while it just sounds like you're a whinge bag, other people, get it because they're like yeah i i, I yeah, have days like yeah. that um yeah. and some people will really open up and it's an avenue for oh god someone gets it right you know mm. a barrage of these are what i'm going through and others will just sit and listen um but it's quite a good way of people appreciating that they're not alone so i didn't have any peers when i was first injured because yeah. i didn't think i needed them yeah, I didn't want to be part of a club. I was, yeah. I had my friends yeah. and I had a job and mm. yeah, they were all, that was all very lovely. And it's not that I was in denial. I just thought I don't need that. But then when I wanted to become a parent, mm. I've got lots of friends who are parents, but none who've had a, dis you know, who have a disability and then become parents. So it was like, right, I need to talk to other people in my position. So yeah, that was kind of my introduction to it. And it's been amazing. And because I work with others with, um, with the spinal cord injury, I have that avenue to discuss it. You know, if I didn't, I think I would certainly be tapping into a group so that I've got that recourse if I need it, rather than, you know, I, I can sit and bend my husband's ear for hours on end, but he's like, well, that's all, you know, what do you want me to do about it? I don't understand. Like, well, yeah, actually, you're right. Um, you live with yeah. me and you hear me whinge, but you're not the one doing it. so yeah. They become desensitised as well, yeah. I think, to it. Do you not think as well that I think, because this I think is another one of the things that happens when you, especially if you, you become injured or ill or something later in life, is you start feeling that you're becoming a burden to your yes. lovers and your partners. And that can cause all manner of problems. I know from some of the peer support groups I've sat in that people who are newly paralysed or newly disabled were saying, you know, I don't want to be a drain and a, and a burden. Yeah because of the stereotypes because one of the big ones is let's face it if you join the club later in life your only point of view is the stereotypes that society holds about us yeah when you because you don't know anything about it yeah. so it's a huge shock 
yeah. when you are it. And that's, I think, why we all need to work together. I mean, talking, you know, like Zek about pain, that was, I was on a pain support group and we, that we'd got this gang of us. Some of us, like myself, had got neuralgic pain. Others had got pain from terminal cancer and others had got, you know, pain from an injured knee. And they were like going, you know, the guy with the knee was going, well, it's only a tendon. I feel really bad to be here. And it's like, look, if your pain is as bad as that's, if that's the worst pain you've had, yeah. that's the worst pain you've had. Yeah. Mine mm -hmm. is the worst pain I've had. Theirs is the worst pain. They, it's not, a, it's, you know, we're not, we're not, it's not, it's a knockout. Oh, well, I'm ever so sorry, but you haven't got the same pain as me, mate. You yeah. know, that's not what it's about. And I think, again, that's what we can offer. Um, I think, I think it's not taking it away from the individual, isn't it? Because, because yeah. I'm a chair user. Yeah. So people, if I talk to people who aren't chair users, they're like, well, you know, my condition isn't as bad as yours. It's like, but you've got your own woes. Yeah. Just because I'm a chair user doesn't take away your woes um, because that you know, that's made your life challenging to you. Yeah. Just because I mean, like, yeah, we, we present differently, yeah. we don't have the, doesn't mean to say we're different and don't have the same challenges that everyday It doesn't life. lessen their pain. No, yeah. exactly. And I, I love the point Mick made about uh, the stereotypes of society. Everyone mm. outside the circle of carers and disabled children I work in always assume that my impairment, my disability, my mental health is caused because my mm. daughter has a disability, which is just not the case. The reason I have mental health, bipolar, anxiety, body dysmorphia, ectal, whatever, is because of the state-sanctioned ignorance around our lives and sort of like that the state enforced prejudice that that, that that the poverty and the isolation and just the fact we're just pushed to one side and forgotten our children forgotten this all builds up as you go along as a parent of a disabled child it's nothing to do with the fact your child has a disability it's all to do with the external support structures yeah. which are just not there which just tell you to go away stop being a burden stop being a drain on society and go and look after your child and you go looking for support you can't find it you go to look for help you can't find it it's endless forms endless bureaucracy the only people we have are each other like we have in this fantastic dhtv gang we hear plus the community groups we build up so that's the reason why i just wanted to make that point for people to say it's because he's got the same child it's not it's not it's exactly, because I mean, it's, there's nothing around yeah. you can it's grab that, onto. It's that thinking, isn't it? Like I was saying about yes. the psychologists being taught that disabled people must be depressed, yeah. that you yeah. must be depressed because you've got a disabled child. Yeah. And it's actually, like you said, the la and that's, I think, something that is a big one to get used to when you yeah. join the game. It's, it's, you find that actually you get used to being physically or mentally different quite quickly. But then you start fighting the exclusion, the, the fact you can't get in places, people don't understand. They, people think, oh, well, you, you must get a free chair and your house is adapted. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Every week, you know, we've all watched Benefit Street. Everyone thinks we're rolling in cash. And when, when you are unable to work, it's real tough. Mm, yeah. what, what do you suggest that people do when they find this, this external barrier, Carol? What, what does the Spinal uh, Injuries Association say to people? How do they support people to to kind of rebuild their life and to get used to the fact they're probably going to have to fight a bit harder from now on. Yeah, and one of the kind of the big things for me is that, and one thing that we will kind of impart to others is that the biggest um, barrier to achieving what they want to achieve in their lives is them. You know, if we ignore society in terms of access and you know getting on buses and you know, physical limitations. If the individual very much wants to do stuff, there's not much that's in their way to stop them. You know, most things are pretty much possible. Um, you know, you were talking about being a parent, but actually, I think conversely, being a parent of a, a small child, it's the children that are keen to learn and they want to what they ask questions. You know, I kind of roll up at school in a wheelchair and the children are like, why have you got wheels? And, oh, that must be quite fun. And you can and see the parents, parents drag like, back. they want the disabled woman, you know, we don't want you to kind of mix yeah, it yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. You know, not in a negative way, but you can also see them going, oh, I kind of want to hear what she says because I'm curious, mm. but I've been too afraid to ask. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah. And we're very open about the fact that we, yeah, it's very obvious for me, but, you know, it's that we have a disability. And that's probably the biggest thing that I want to impart on people, that just ask if you're curious. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. don't I think, think I mean that... I think I, do, I will say I do think that I, I think that disabled people are expected to tell more information than they should do and that society shouldn't we should tell you not you ask us don't come up yes. and say, oh, what happened to you mate but have a conversation with it we've we've just seen all of us have just told you basically <laughs> lovely viewers our medical life history 
Yeah. Right? And that's part of what we're doing is a show, but also because that's what we like. But I find that when you're in that situation where you're out and someone comes up and goes, oh, I may want to you. And it's like, oh, not again. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, it, yeah. and there are a set of questions you get asked as a disabled man with paralysis. It's always, so does it work down there? Yeah. Which is the most important. That's the question that I get asked probably <laughs> more often than any other. Uh, and, um, you know, because to most other men, that's the worst thing. You know, sod not being able to walk. If that's not on, it's all terrible. Um, I don't know these people. I don't know what they're talking about. It's amazing. It's like, like if that doesn't work, it's, you're not, it's yeah. the end of your career. Like that's your career. Yeah. Well, to be honest, yeah. what, basically, what basically it means tends to be is that then people think that your your partner is fair game because like, obviously they're not with a real man, but we won't go into all that. That's um, a whole other so, programme. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, Zek, when you get when when it all started happening, and you like you know you 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 realise this is it. How did you start to rebuild your life? How did you start to get back to being the wonderful Zek the Tech we know now? I didn't know I hid. Literally, <laughs> I I yeah. because of the pain and the fatigue, I disappeared from society. And all friends allowed that to happen. I just disappeared. Mm. I've dropped off the face of the earth. And it's only through blogging. I started blogging for just a cathartic sort of thing, you know, to get a lot of crap off my chest. Mm. And then found that, hang on, you know, there's the disability community out there. And just getting involved with all that. I, I don't exist in the real world. I'm a bit like Max Hedrum. This is yeah. this is me, and outside the front door very rarely happens unless I'm off to see a doctor or if my wife says, right, enough, out. But I don't, I, I'm i very happy. I'm, because of my mental health, and it appears in the last couple of years that there's, I'm probably on the autistic spectrum. I'm, hap I'm happy to hide away from life. Um, mm. It's wrong, but for me, it works. I see, see, this is the thing. I think this is one of the things that happens when you do join the gang. Is there is a prescribed way of doing it, and and I mean at the moment it's do sport, go yeah. and go be a Paralympian. Go, you've got to be sporty. Yep. <laughs> Activity makes you better. I, I mean, I hated sport before I couldn't walk. So the last thing I was going to do when I got in a wheelchair was take up sport. Right? It's like, see, I finally got an excuse to get out of it. Um, but so I took up music, and it's it's finding the way that works for you isn't it, I think, rather than saying, well, I should really be going out, it would be good if you did, if you want to. But if you think, well, actually, it's a bit much for me now, then as long as it's not making you depressed to be in, then you're all right. If you're, but one of the big ones, and I bet everyone shares this, is you join the gang, whether it's you've got a disabled child, you are, just, you are the disabled child, or you become disabled, and all your friends go. And yep. you have to totally rebuild your friend group because everyone doesn't know what to say. They don't know how to cope. I mean, I know my mum and dad said when I was born, my mum and dad had a very healthy, active social life at all, was having parties, and poof, everyone went suddenly. You poof, know, and, <laughs> yeah, and it, it happened to me. I mean, you know, 15, I was at school, I had a gang of mates. I went into hospital, yeah. I came out, never saw one of them again. Never. That's it, gone. Um, so does that happen a lot? Do, uh, Carol, is that something that lots of the people that you work with say? That, you Sometimes. Know, I mean, my personal experience wasn't that. Um, oh, right. But I did have the, interestingly, it was more work colleagues. I went to a barbecue um, from hospital. I kind of had a, a discharge night out. And it, I could see um, them kind of look at me going, I don't know what to say to her. I don't know what to say to her. Yeah. Um, and my then partner came to pick me up um, and they were talking to him. And he, they said, just talk to her. You know, she's not. She's just paralysed, you know, she's, there's yeah, nothing wrong yeah. with her. Um, she's still Carol. You can still talk to her about mm. stuff. And um, But absolutely, people, it's perception, isn't it? They assume that people are not going to want to be with them. Um, you believe or think that certainly if you've got a disability that involves using a chair, for example, going out is going to be a flaff, so therefore it's just best not to invite that person. Um but, you know, people will stick with you if they genuinely care. You know, the, the disability will not be the barrier. They will find ways of overcoming it. I mean, I'm, ironically, we went to a, a 40th birthday party a few years ago now, and the host was one of a dear friends, but had made all sorts of plans to make sure that I could get in, I could have disabled parking at the back of the restaurant. 
amazing. Um, all good, got there, and then the table that they put us on because we we're a table of about 20, three steps up. And then no one had come, no one had really Definitely. thought. Yeah. It's like, you yeah. know, we made sure that Carol can come in through the back. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, so lot, you know, yeah. they make the effort. And I often have people say, well, I kind of forget that you're disabled, which is quite charming, but also yeah. quite... You don't know whether that's yeah. offensive or yeah. not. Yeah, I, no, I'm not, people I'm always say me. it. People say it as a compliment. Yeah, but actually, it's kind of not because it. I, it's funny because at the moment, I, I'm after lockdown. I've, I've, I'm building a new gang of friends. I, you know, kind of I was a bit insular for a while, and I kind of want to make some new friends. And there, I'm having to train them up what to look out for because one of the big ones is everyone thinks everything's sorted. Oh, you've got the Equality yeah. Act now. Everything's accessible, isn't it? You're fine. And then you go out and, like you said, oh, that's up steps. Like I said, last night I went out to a pub, no toilet. Yeah, I saw the tweet, you know? yeah. And it's just like, I can't believe that, you know, here we are. And everyone was like, do you mean there's no toilet? Of course it's got a toilet. No, it hasn't got a toilet. And yeah. to be honest, I think that's one of the biggest barriers for the disabled person to get yeah. over. And yeah. I'm, I'm finding that the reason why this has kind of become clear to me is because coming out of lockdown is a bit like becoming disabled again. I've forgotten how bad it was yeah. and it's, yeah. it's why i really wanted to do this item because you know you suddenly remember god i remember how awful it was to keep going out and going oh i can't come in oh i can't go to the loo oh I, anyway you have fun guys bye sorry yeah. Yeah. and you know that's i think you know that that's one of the big ones to get used to so if you're going through that don't worry you're not alone and that's why there are all these people out there fighting to try and make difference to make it better than that um now we're coming nearly to the end he says looking at his timer we've got three minutes left um what yeah, that'll one, work. yeah yeah i know, I know. <laughs> what one thing do you think got you through when things were dark um i think i asked dan first well it, it's it's going to be the cliche but it's it's seeing emily every morning because she as you know mick she's like a little she is the oncoming storm, like most of our disabled children are, and she just sings and laughs and shouts. If something annoys her, she's got her own opinion. She'll tell it to them straight. Part of the reason why she won the National Diversity Award is she doesn't, she's got her own opinion. She'll stick to it. Something annoys her. She'll tell them about it. She can't get into a place. She will tell them about it. She'll want to see the person in charge. So, yeah, it's, it's basically being a unit still, being, being a family. But I, I will say when, Carol was talking about friends and stuff because Emily's always been disabled. Obviously, a lot of friends have fallen away, but she's still left with a hardcore of four friends that she's known since junior school. She's still friends with her now. Incredible. And I must say, they've been brilliant. But And every time they have a party, they always go and seek out the most accessible place. It's got to have this, my friend. It's got to have this, my yeah. friend. You haven't got it? Well, we can't use your premises then. Sorry. Mm. Goodbye. So yeah, Emily still has that core of friends, but Carol's right. Ch children are fantastic other children they will ask questions and they're right to ask because we need yeah. to keep their imaginations open yeah. so yeah I, i'm gonna big up for the kids because i think their generation will be the ones that will, will actually get it i hope so it would be great to think that, that the people like us in say 30 years time yeah yeah will have a very different experience yeah, and you know, a show like this won't be needed. We've got so many amazing comments. I can't even read them all I out. Saw mainly them. Yeah, mainly we will get to I've, them after. Yeah, I've, I've unfortunately uh, got my contact lenses in, but they've gone all misty, so I can't see the screen. So someone else will have to do that. But um, uh, what? What? So one one thing that got you through, Carol, when you were kind of down. I bet everyone's going to say family, aren't they? Really? Yeah. Yeah. Although I didn't, I didn't have my son. Obviously, at the time mm. that I became. Um, paralyzed i i was never ill you know i could because my condition was um you know a, a, a condition i was mm. never poorly so um mentally whilst it was challenging mm. i didn't i didn't have an illness if anything for me it was more of a grieving process yes. i was grieving yeah. for the life that i had that i didn't have anymore or couldn't see that i had anymore mm. but as time went on i'm more you know, I then married my partner and we did stuff that I did before. You know, we went skiing, we cycle, mm. we do a lot of stuff that was important to me. And at the time, I didn't think I was going to be able to do yeah. that. Yeah. Once I realised that I could, the realisation was, actually, it's not as shit as I thought it could be. You know, as, as, as rubbish as this go is going to be and it's not how I plan my life to be, mm -hmm. it's going to be all right. 
Um, and absolutely have dips and spurts. Um, and now, quite rightly, my motivation is my son. You know, he yeah. gets up at six o'clock and I don't have a choice. It's like, well, mommy's yeah. not feeling great today. Well, I need breakfast. You know, you need to do, I need to get to school. And you're like, okay. Um, so now it's probably that. But I think it's very common for people to go through that grieving yeah, I, process and for me it took a long time Yeah, you know, i thought i was okay back to work did normal stuff yeah. um and probably hit a barrier about three years in it was a bit of a right this isn't yes. this really yeah. is for the long term isn't it do you know what that's funny because i think that's another thing that people think is you're going to be down at the start and then you're going to yeah. rebuild and actually you get down at really weird times yeah because when you're in the thick of it and you're learning to cope it's it's you're in the battlefield but like, you know, Zek with his, his uh, PTSD, I, I actually think we, one, like you said, go through a grieving process. We grieve for the person we were going to be, the future yeah. we won't have anymore. And then I think we have to go through another phase of, of post-traumatic stress disorder, coping with hospitals and illnesses and the, the, the whole thing. And then you come out of it. But I will say to all you lovely viewers who are going through it right now, you do come out of yeah. it. Yes. So now, before we go, because we've come to the end and we're overrunning already because yeah. my timer was wrong, um, can everybody say top three tips for rebuilding your life? Um, and I think I'll go with Zek. Uh, what, what, what are your tips, Zek? Tips for rebuilding your life. It's got to be be honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. You've got to be brutally honest or it isn't going to work. Take control of your health. That's with doctors and stuff like that. And if needs be, pull out of healthcare if it's safe to do so. Don't be a patient. That helped me a lot. And oh, I'm going to go with cake. I love cake. <laughs> I like that tip. That's a good tip. Yeah. Um, Dan, what are your t uh, top three tips? Uh, mine would be firstly, stay away from the negative people. Just stay mm -hmm. away from them. Don't let them anywhere near your life. Stay away from the doomers and the naysayers and people like that. Just stick to the core people who are around you who love you support you just stick to the people online that you you empathize with and most importantly just just stick with your family and believe in yourself because it's a cliche to say but the sun always does shine after a very very dark night and it it does get better it does all be ups and downs but it does get better but cut yeah. out negativity cut out the people you don't in your life and don't yeah. come back to them start on a new and, path with better people and carol what are your top three tips so it kind of linked to that, I suppose. My um, my first one would be there are lots of stuff in the world that frustrate me and get me angry, but I can do very little about it as an individual. So you know, certainly that we do within the charity, we campaign for change. You know, talk to people mm -hmm. about what's bothering you, why it's bothering you, and campaign for it to be changed rather than repetitively go back to the same scenario and just get annoyed about it. Mm -hmm. um, my second would be, you know, you are your own limitation. You know, I get that we've got pain, we've got other things going on, um, but if you want to achieve with the right support, you can. Um, and then thirdly, and probably natural that I would say this, but use your peers, you know, talk to other people who've been through what you've been through, whatever scenario, get a bit of perspective on it. Um, you know, that will make, a, I think, a whole range of difference. Um, so yeah, yeah, then I got three. Brilliant. Uh, do you know what, it's funny because I, I totally agree. Oh, I think, cake. Can I have four? Big, oh, yeah, cake. Of course you can have four. Yeah, if it's cake. everyone can have cake. Uh, I, I agree. I think, I think, one, don't believe all the things you thought you knew about disability. They're all yeah. rubbish, right? It's not the end of your life. It's not, it's not going to be terrible. It can be amazing and wonderful. And you can come out of it to the other end after you've got through all this rubbish you're going to go through and actually find that your life is a thousand times better and happier and more fulfilled. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help ever. Um, there's nothing wrong with saying I can't do something or because then by being able to ask for help, I think then you can actually find a new way of doing it. Um, and people do help you out of love. It's, you're not a burden. Uh, so, and then the last one is do things you love. When you're fighting your way back, find the things you love and try and find a way of doing, whether it's skiing or hand cycling or music or art or sport or sitting on the sofa eating cake. Do it because that means that you're rebuilding, the. you're, you're focusing on the joy because that's yeah. the truth of it. You've, had, you've experienced life at its crappiest and now you know how short and wonderful and precious life is. So go out exactly. there and go right. And yes, you're going to face all kind of rubbish and you're not going to find the support and la, la, la. There's going to be loads of people out there. There's a Spinal, uh, spinal Injury Association. There's loads of people to get support from. But there's also disabled people. Get on Twitter. 
get following yeah. disabled people on Twitter. We are the yeah. most amazing support group, and we'll be there for you too. So Absolutely. I am going to say, uh, but that's it. We better go because I've over, we've overrun by four minutes again. Um, so let's say goodbye. So goodbye from Dan. Cheerio, guys. Take care. Thank you very much. More cake for me, I think. Now my plate is <laughs> empty. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I think goodbye from Zach. Okay, small. Goodbye. <laughs> we will see you whenever. Next, two weeks. Two time. weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two time. Weeks. That's the one I'm prepared. A huge and massive thank you to Carol, and uh, we will probably see each other uh, more. Um, you know, as another fellow spinal injury type person. Uh, You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. I've done some stuff with SIA in the past, so um, you know I, I'm sure we'll bump into each other. Uh, now we can all go. Thank you so much for all your wonderful comments. I know I haven't read them out. Next time, I'm going to make sure that I've got some eye drops for my contact lenses so I can see them. We will answer them lovely. on social uh, media, and they are amazing. Thank yeah. you so much. And I think that that's it. So if you've just joined the gang, or if you're fairly new, don't worry. It's going to get better. It's going to get brilliant. And I'm saying this just as the most heavy rainstorm I've ever seen has just hit Camden Town. So with that, I'm going to sign off before I get struck by lightning. Uh, thank you all for watching. See you all in two weeks' time. So that's it. Bye-bye from the show with no name. See you next time. Bye. 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 Bye.